right, let's pray. God, thank you for the word of God. And once again, we pray that you would help us as we uh, look at your word together. Do the work that's necessary, Lord, to break hard hearts, to encourage, to uh, move us on for you. And Lord, we ask that, uh, I ask that you give me the help and strength I need to be able to impart these truths in a way that would be more than just knowledge, but that would um, encourage and help my brothers and sisters here tonight. And so, Lord, to that end, we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. We, uh, we enter into agreements all the time, right? We, oh yes, I'm going to do this, and I'm going to take this product, and, and we often uh, think about agreements with different entities, and we feel like we do that because we feel like they're beneficial to us. So we sign a cell phone contract because we feel like that's going to be the best deal for us, or you sign up with Amazon because you want to get cheap products, free shipping, those kinds of things. We decided to get a Costco membership because uh, we can get better prices, uh, especially for a big family like ours. And uh, so uh, often we, uh, you know, we, we get into an agreement with these things and, uh, and we don't often read the fine print of the benefits. And uh, we just kind of assume them. And every once in a while you find that there are things that you, oh, I didn't realize I could have had this with this, with this benefit. And sometimes, of course, there's also in the fine print something that you didn't know, and uh, and you can get yourself in trouble. On April 1st, uh, back in 2000, oh boy, I don't, I don't have it written down here. Um, I think it was 2008, the game station uh, put in their uh, fine print this, to grant uh, us a non-transferable option to claim for now and forevermore your immortal soul. Should we wish to exercise this option, you agree to surrender your immortal soul and any claim you may have on it within five days working of receiving written notification from Game Station or one of its duly authorized minions. Now they did it as a joke, but 7,500 people clicked on it without ever realizing that. And some people saw that there was an opt out of giving your immortal soul to Game Station, and they received a little coupon for that. But And it, again, it was just a joke and, a, and an illustration of how we often enter into contracts. We don't really know what we've, what we've done or what, what either the detractors or the benefits that we get from that. And uh, transitioning then, when you think about when you got saved, most of you did not know all that you were getting or all that happened when you got saved. Probably, if I had to guess, Probably when you got saved, your number one concern is, I don't want to go to hell when I die, right? That's the number one thing. Maybe it was, I want to know God. I want to know who he is. But honestly, a lot of those things that we know now as Christians, and especially Christians for a while, are things that we've learned afterward. And I've just found in my own Christian life that it is a blessing and a joy to unwrap, to read the fine print of all the benefits and blessings that I get from being a Christian. When I got saved, no, I can't get any more saved, right? When I got saved, I got saved. There's no getting more and more saved. But what I'm understanding is all the benefits that come with being a Christian. And as I reflect on those, and as I grow older and, and understand what it means more and more that what Christ did for me, the more I'm appreciative of those things. Paul was praying for the Colossians here, and he, his prayer was that they would grow. He, he said that he was he gave thanks for them in verse number three, and then he says in verse number nine, for this cause we also, since the day we heard of it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Again, he wanted them to increase in that, to, to grow in it, to understand who God was and what he did for them. And he wishes them good. And he mentions that in verse 11, strengthened with all might, according to his glorious power, unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness, giving thanks unto the Father. Now, this is what Paul does sometimes. He mentions something like Father or Christ or forgiveness or salvation or gospel, and then from there, there he goes on. So again, what we're looking at, we just looked at 9 through 12, the first part that we just read last time, 
And then he mentions the Father, and then he goes off on this other tangent that's kind of a part of this prayer for them and thanks for them, but really it's kind of a separate idea because what he's going to say is now thinking about the Father, we're giving thanks to the Father. What has the Father done for us? And the rest for verses 12 to 14 is a little sampling of what the Father has done for us. So again, let's read verse 12. Giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Uh, now, when he says, in whom... That's talking about Christ. And that, mentioning Christ, is going to set off a whole other uh, digression about Jesus in verses 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, all the way down. You'll have to hear that next week. But this week, we're just going to look at verses 12 through 14. What is it? He says, giving thanks to the Father, which hath what? What did the Father do for us? He mentions four different things in this passage. So what are the benefits of being saved? What has God done for us? And if you've never thought to read the fine print on what it means that you're saved, then you are in for a treat. Now, honestly, what I'm going to say tonight is nothing different than I say almost every time I preach. I just love to preach about the gospel. I love to preach about what Christ did for us in dying for us. I love to preach about what it means to be a Christian, a gospel-centered Christian, because Jesus Christ dying on the cross, and I've said this over and over again, Dan, Cheryl, Dwayne, you're going to hear this for the next 50 years. Uh, <laughs> so I don't get sick of saying it. The gospel is not just about me getting saved as, and that's it. That was the beginning of the gospel. The gospel is living with Jesus Christ, what he has done for me. And the more that we as Christians can preach the gospel to ourselves, the healthier we will be. It's the blood of Christ in every situation. It's the power of Christ in every moment of our lives. That is the gospel. And so let's not just, let's not stay at, I got saved and I don't have to go to hell. That's wonderful. Amen. I'll never knock that ever. But God has so much more for us. So let's move on. What he says is what God has done. He hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in life. He has allowed us to share in his inheritance. Now the word inheritance means an apportionment. It means a share or a, a part that's been given usually by a benefactor. We are being treated like the saints. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But I think it's talking about the Old Testament saints. You look back and you read all these great people in the Old Testament. And you, you read about Joseph and Daniel and David and Moses and Abraham. And God is going to give me the same inheritance that he gave them. That's an amazing thing. That God would think of me in the same way that he thought of them. Now, when we think about an inheritance, an inheritance is usually a good thing, right? Uh, it's usually something that's beneficial. Most of the time when we talk about an inheritance from a physical standpoint, it's money. It might be a piece of property or land, you know, land holding or something like that. Maybe an antique or something valuable that's been passed down to you. When my grandmother died, I, I got, I think, like $4,000, and then we also got uh, some of her jewelry. They, they thought it would be important for the grandchildren to have that. Now, I've never worn it because it's earrings, and I've never got my ear pierced, but... Amen. <laughs> give it to my daughters, and uh, they'll enjoy it someday. But it was something that is, is valuable. Give it to benefit your children or grandchildren. It's, it's interesting, as you do a study of the word inheritance or inherit uh, in the New Testament, often the word inherit is in the same verse or referring to the kingdom of God. So it's not just, again, the, the health and wealth. Hey, if we're an inheritance of God, then he's going to give us all his money. And, and you don't have, you know, God wants to, you know, heal your wallet and, and he's going to make you rich because that's the inheritance. Well, the inheritance is the kingdom of God. Uh, it's a spiritual. Now, I'm not going to say that God won't take care of you physically when it comes to when you have needs financially or otherwise, God will take care of you. That's just not what he's talking about here. 
That means that we get to be a part of his kingdom here on the earth. It means that we get to enjoy the benefits of being a part of God's kingdom while we're on the earth. And then, of course, it also means that one day we get to be a part of the kingdom of God when it's on the earth, when it's physically manifested. Like we talked about this morning, when Jesus is reigning on the earth, we get to reign with him. That's part of our inheritance. That's part of something that I, that it's a benefit for me. It's something I'm looking forward to and absolutely something that I don't deserve. Uh, we'll get into that a little bit later too. So how did we come into this inheritance? Most inheritances come there by rights. You're genetically um, connected to the person who died, right? Um, so, I mean, if you're thinking about your family tree and you know, like I do on my dad's side especially, that there's nobody who's wealthy at all. I'm, I'm never gonna get a call from someone saying, your father's da 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 da, uh, you know, uh, they died and, and now I'm gonna give you $18 million. That'll never happen. Now on my mom's side, she's from England, so who knows? I mean, we just, who knows, but probably not, you know. Um, and I get it too that sometimes you have eccentric millionaires who just, leave inheritances to random people. I, I read about uh, a person who was wealthy, didn't have any children, wasn't married, and picked 70 names out of the phone book, just randomly, oh. just flipped through the phone book, 70 names and put them in. And when the attorneys contacted them and said, you, you are now an, uh, an inheritor of this money, they thought it was a scam, you know? Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, let me talk to your Nigerian widow and we'll set this up, sure. <laughs> You know, and uh, but no, it was real. So, but most of the time, isn't it true that there's a there's a reason why you are the inheritor? You're the uh, that you're, you're the heir. There's some connection, and and sometimes when these eccentric millionaires uh, all of a sudden, like Leona Helmsley, who left seventy million dollars or something to her dog, uh, when she does something crazy like that, then what do the children do? They get their lawyers, right? And they say, no, 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 no. I'm going to get some of that money for me because I deserve it, because I have a right to that money. You know, that when I came to Christ, I didn't have any claim at all. I couldn't go to the gates of heaven and say, hey, now, hold on. I get to be in heaven too. I've earned it. I deserve it. Nobody, nobody can do that. If anybody's going to be an inheritor, if anybody's going to be an heir to heaven, it will be because God made it that way. We were enemies, and God had to, look at what verse 12 says, he hath made us meet. The word meet means suitable. It means that he did something in me to make it so that now I can be an heir of God, whereas before I had no claims at all on him, I could be now. Again, it could be that I would I would go and, and meet, uh, let's say, Bill Gates. I don't know that I really want to be related to Bill Gates, but let's say that he was looking for an heir. And I went and talked to Bill Gates, and he said, all right, if you renounce your father and your mother, then I will adopt you as my 42-year-old son. And when I die, you'll get, you know, so much of my fortune. I, that could happen. But that would have to happen on his part. Like, I couldn't go to the court and say, yes, my name is Joshua, and I'd like my last name to be Gates. I would like my birth certificate to say Bill Gates on it, and, and well, I'm Melinda or whoever. Uh, you know, and this is now my name. I could not do that and have Bill Gates say, well, I guess if your name is Josh Gates and, and you, you, you say that I'm your father. Like, I couldn't do that. Same thing with God. We can't make ourselves an heir of God. It had to be God to make us meet so that we could be partakers of the inheritance. It wasn't something that we could do on our own. Now, though, we can count ourselves as God's people. This is why it says, in, again, in verse 12, He hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. Now, that word light is going to play into the next verse, so I won't dwell a whole lot on that. But the idea, again, is that all the benefits that we read about that God loves, when you read in the Old Testament, all these people that God loves and cares about and says, I'll bless you, all those things, He now treats me in the same way. He's made me an heir with all these saints. Now Romans 8, 16 and 17 says that he's also made me a joint heir with Christ, which that's an amazing thing to think about, that he would give me the same inheritance of heaven that he has given Christ, that he 
You know, the Bible says in Isaiah that he won't share his glory. And I'll never expect the same glory that I get with God. But one day he will share that part of his glory with me. That he'll allow me to be in heaven in his presence. Remember we read about this morning in Revelation that the, the light uh, that God himself lights that place. There's no need of a sun or a candle or anything because his glory is the light of it. And I get to share in some way in that glory someday. That's a blessed thing. This goes beyond then just, oh, one of the benefits is that I don't have to go to hell. This means that I can claim my inheritance, which 1 Peter 1, 4 says is incorruptible and undefiled and fadeth not away and is reserved in heaven for you. That's great that he would put all those descriptors into your inheritance. That's the first benefit. Second is that he has delivered us from the power of darkness. It's, which says in verse number 13, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness. Now that's just the first half of this, so we'll talk about the second half. But that he has delivered us from the, from the power of darkness. And the power of darkness represents, first of all, the forces of Satan in this world. We are no longer bound by the world. Again, okay, we'll talk about the world next week in Sunday school, but we are no longer bound by the world. We're no longer bound by the philosophy and thinking of the world. We often go that way, but we are not bound to that. We don't have to think like the world thinks. We're also free from the forces of sin. We're free from the power of sin. Romans 6, verse 17 says, God, be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered to you. Being then made free from sin, ye became, ye became the servants of righteousness. That's a great thing to think about, that he's delivered us from the power of darkness, that, that sin no longer has any force on me. You say, well, why do I still sin? Well, you still sin because you want to sin. I don't, I don't think I do. Oh, well, I think you do. <laughs> Otherwise, you wouldn't. I, I, Satan comes, like we talked about in Sunday school, Satan comes and says, this is good for you. This is something that you want to do. And you say, yeah, that's right, I do. And you sin. And then you say, why did I do that? Well, I did that because I believed the lies of Satan. And there was a part of my flesh that wanted to do this. But here's the thing. You don't have to do those things. The devil cannot make you sin. The devil can't make you do anything. You are free from the power of sin. You have been delivered from the power of darkness. Now again, he doesn't say, notice, this isn't what, what in Greek terms we call aorist. It just means past tense. Notice it says, who hath delivered us. It doesn't say, is delivering us. That's in some way true, but it's more true that past tense, God delivered us. The Father has already delivered us from the power of darkness. He delivered us from it. The word delivered means to rescue. It means it was not in our power to get ourselves out. Like Egypt, like Israel in Egypt, when you read about the, uh, the Israelites, they were, uh, they were in Egypt. They come there because of Jacob and his family to get away from the famine. And while they were there, they grew and multiplied. And one day, uh, Pharaoh, who didn't know Joseph, came and said, There's a, there are too many Israelites here. We've got to subjugate them. And they put them under slavery. And, and then when the population started to grow even more, they said, we've got to do something to quell this and, and to try to kill some of these people unless they revolt against us or lest another come company or country comes in and tries to take us over, then they would join with them and, and fight against us. We can't have this anymore. But for whatever reason, the Israelites never rose up and fought. They had the slave mentality. And when Moses came and said, God said to let you go, uh, remember, they, they, didn't, they couldn't do anything about it. I mean, they had to just wait for God to deliver plague after plague after plague after plague. And then finally, Pharaoh let them go. And then they went out in the wilderness, and there they were, by the Red Sea. And when Pharaoh came after them, all they could do was, oh, we should have died in Egypt, and not out here in the wilderness. They had no power at all to deliver themselves, and God had to part the Red Sea so that they could walk through. God had to do all of it. God had to rescue them and deliver them from beginning to end. That it was not in our power to deliver ourselves. The power needed to be on God, because we would never have delivered ourselves. I know that some of you, before you got saved, you maybe had thoughts of, well, well, I, I, if only I had the power to not do this anymore. If only I had the power to be a, a better person or 
kinder person or to not be so addicted to these things. I know that for some of you that was that was very a, maybe a frustrating thing, but let's be honest. Most of most of the people that are uh, that were that can remember what it was like to be unsaved really had very little thought about being delivered from sin. And some of you probably chased sin pretty hard. Why well, would I want to be delivered from it? I like it. I like these things, uh, but I don't want to be delivered from it. And there was a day that you understood that you were going to face a holy God and that he was going to call you into question for all the wrong things that you did. And at that moment, your soul said, what am I going to do? I'm going to face a God and I'm going to face his wrath. And God delivered you from the power of darkness when you cried out to him and gave you deliverance from the power of sin and from the power of Satan in your life. The power of darkness is like a kingdom. And I think that's, again, why he says he had delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. Now, it doesn't say this, but could we say who hath delivered us from the kingdom of darkness or maybe from the power of the kingdom of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son? The power of darkness was this kingdom of darkness that kept us captive. And uh, just like the French in 1944 could not rescue themselves, they needed American and British troops to come in and uh, to rescue them and to, and to liberate Paris. Uh, just like uh, as those troops marched past Paris into Germany and Austria and Poland and started to liberate the camps, uh, the, the people in the camps could not deliver themselves. They needed a greater power to do that. Thank God that he had the power to deliver us from the power of darkness because we had no power in and of ourselves to do that. Now, not just that he delivered us, but notice he has translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. I'll talk about what that word means in a little bit, but you know, it's interesting. God could have just taken us out of the power of darkness and left us in limbo. Right? He could have just said, all right, sin no more, has no more power on you, and then walked away. And that would have been enough. That would have been a great, great thing. But he then put us into his kingdom. He made us a part of his work. Like we talked about this morning, the work that God's doing that started at the very beginning when he made all things good, and then it fell into sin and disrepair and corruption. And at the cross, Christ began and in some ways, finally, won back the right to be the king of the world so that he could, again, starting with us, remake creation into what it should be. And again, I didn't get into this this morning, but in Romans 8 there, what it says when it says that the creation is groaning and, uh, and, and understands that it's under the bondage of corruption, the whole point of that passage is what creation is waiting for is the manifestation of the sons of God, meaning this, that when we get our new resurrection bodies, all of creation is going to say, oh, you are making everything new. And what, how does that start? That starts with me. When I get born again and God makes me into a new creature, into a new person, then my spirit is being made new. And all creation sees that and says, God is making all things new. Now, it won't be for a while. But God, I know, we know that God is going to finish it because he's already started it in me. And, and uh, again, I didn't want to bring this out, but in, uh, in Ephesians 1, it says that we have received the earnest of the inheritance, meaning this, the down payment that God will finish that creative work and the redemptive work finally is the Holy Spirit within me. And so when I think about the work that God's doing in all of creation, I'm a part of that. Why? Because he's translated me into the kingdom of God. He's translated me into the kingdom of light. I'm not in darkness anymore. I'm in the kingdom, uh, the kingdom of light I'm in his dear son. This is the kingdom that we should have been a part of from the beginning, but we messed it up. We messed it up, and we continue to mess it up. And God, in his mercy now, is made, has made a new kingdom, one that's the right way, one, one that's the way it should be. The, the joy and the fellowship that we enjoy in our church, the, the, the gladness that we have when, when we rejoice with people who do the right thing, or when we uh, can talk after church and, and be encouraged, that's the way it's supposed to be all the time on this earth. Can you imagine a world like that, where people would only encourage each other? There'd be no trolls online, you're stupid, comment. You know, there'd be nothing like that. It would only be joy and encouragement and love. Wouldn't it be great to be in a world like that? We in this church just get a little glimpse of that. But this is part of the kingdom of God. 
He said, man, I, I wish it could be like this all the time and in every sphere of life. One day it will be in heaven. This is a little taste. How is it, how is it that we can enjoy such fellowship and such joy? It's because we're a part of a different kingdom. We come in this building on Sunday nights and Wednesday, Sunday mornings and Wednesday nights, and it's like this little bubble away from the kingdom of darkness and the power of darkness. And we just took it to experience if things are working right, the kingdom of light, right? Because not every church is like that, right? And it, I'm not going to take for granted that our church will always be like that, but as long as we're all spirit-led, then this is a little bubble. This is the way the kingdom of God is supposed to be. This is the way the world was supposed to be from the beginning. And we get to get a part of that. We got trans translated from the old to this new. He translated us. The word means to be carried away or to be removed. It means to exchange. We were in the kingdom of darkness. What Ephesians 2 says, we were by nature the children of wrath. Now here we are in as new creatures in the kingdom of God. Now again, translation. When you think about a Bible translation, it's taking this word that people probably can't read and putting it into a word that people can read. So you take this word and you move it, same meaning, it means the same thing. It's the same same person, right? You're the same person, but now you're a different person. You've been changed. If you look at a Greek word and an English word, you'd think they're very, very different, and they are, but they're the same. God's translated us from one of these, he's moved us from one to the other. He moved our citizenship from there to here. Um, we, one of the things that has been so heartbreaking over the last year, is to think about all those promises that we made to all these Afghans who were helping us in Afghanistan. They, we hired them on to be translators, to be guides, to be helps to us, and we promised them that we would take care of them. We promised them that we would do all we could for them and their families. And it was so heartbreaking to see America just pull out and leave all of these Afghans behind. And then to watch the government actually give a list of people of who they were to the Taliban, it doesn't make any sense to me. But the promise was that we would have translated them from there to here, that we would have given them eventually maybe, for some of them, U.S. citizenship. Now we can, we can argue that whether they should be U.S. citizens or not, but the, the point is that we promised them that we would do that. So it's the same idea, that we were in a hostile environment we were in a place where we were, uh, that, that was going to eventually kill us forever. And God moved our citizenship from there, from a hostile environment, to a place of love and a place of protection from Him. 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9 to 11 says, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? There's that word inherit again. Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. He says, this was you, you were part of that kingdom, but it's different now. Now you're washed, now you're sanctified, now you're justified, and God has done it all. He's moved you from the old kingdom into the new kingdom. The corrupt kingdom to a kingdom of life. The kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. And now you get to be a part of that. And again, you had nothing to do with it. God had to do all of it. He translated us into this new kingdom. The emphasis then in our lives ought to be this new citizenship. We are a called out people. That's what the word sanctified means. It means people that have been set apart for a specific purpose. That's why the church is called the church. The church, the, the word in Greek is ekklesia. Ek means out and uh, klesia is a form of kaleo, which means to call. We are a called out assembly. We're a people that are, we don't just meet here to talk about things that everybody else in every bar in town talks about. We're here for a different purpose. We are a called out assembly. And our citizenship is to reflect that fact that we are not a part of the world. 
Right? There's interaction and interactive points, and here we are living in this world, and we ought to be the best Christian we can. Just understand that your citizenship is not in this world, it's in the kingdom of God. So Ephesians verse 2, chapter 2, verse 19 says, Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but instead fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. In 1 Peter 2, verse 9, But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Again and again we see the emphasis is on our new citizenship. We are to live by our new kingdom, not our old one. And part of the Christian life is learning what that new kingdom looks like and uh, shedding some of the habits of the old kingdom. Uh, I've shared this story before, but um, I grew up in, in Indiana. And, um, well, you know, Ross, I, I've heard about this thing called Minnesota Nice. Which yeah. isn't. <laughs> Which isn't very. It, it's, it, it's, it's polite. <laughs> But, you know, I grew up with not Indiana nice, Indiana friendly, okay, so, and I grew up in northern Indiana, don't think I lived in, in the backwoods or anything, I mean, there were cornfields all around, but uh, it, just, it just is a different feel than here. Now, I, I, it's still part of the Midwest, so I still love the Midwest. I'll just say that when I came here, I had to learn to not be so friendly, especially when it came to driving and seeing a friend and honking a horn. That's what you do when you see friends that you know. And if you're in Indiana and you get honked, up, honked at, it's probably because there's someone that you know. Now, if you don't know anybody in Indiana, then maybe just watch your driving a little bit. But when I'm in Indiana, I see a friend, I honk at them, and they, they're, the, 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 they're gonna wave more than they're gonna be like, what's going on? But I didn't know that when I came to Minnesota. So I remember seeing uh, Pat Henderson and uh, I, I, she didn't see me, so I had to honk my horn, and she turned like that, <laughs> and saw it was me, it was like, <laughs> I talked to her later, and I'm like, don't you honk? She's like, we do not, we do not honk here. <laughs> okay, good to know. How many of you Minnesotans are, can agree with that? We do not honk at people. Okay, all right, so yeah, it wasn't just a bad thing. Anyway. These are things you have to learn, right? Otherwise, you, you offend people. So do we now you know. If you're, to, <laughs> if you're used to honking people in Missouri, you don't do that here. You can honk at me, though. I don't mind. I'll wave, yeah. <laughs> there you go, Roger. Pretend you don't know them. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. That's the next thing. Yeah. When you go to a new country, you don't keep saying, well, we, we did it this way. You don't live like you're in the old country. You start living like you're in the new country. And missionaries, like like um, our missionaries, if they go overseas and they start living like Americans, they won't get very far with people. Um, they, uh, and again, there's some precautions they have to take, but, uh, but you need to plug into that new kingdom. And uh, as Christians, we understand we're translated into a new kingdom, the, the kingdom of his dear son. The word dear just means beloved. His, his beloved son, the, the son that he loves, the son that he gave for us. This is his kingdom. Now, it would be enough, wouldn't it, if he just saved us from hell. But what he has done is he has given us an inheritance. He has taken us out from the power of darkness, and he has to put us in to the kingdom of his dear son. The last thing we see in verse number 14 is that he has given us redemption and forgiveness. The word redemption, interestingly enough, if you look it up in the Greek and do a little word study on the word redemption, it means literally to buy from the slave market. So we all understand in some ways what slavery has looked like throughout the years. Uh, they would capture people and sometimes in wartime, uh, very little, from what I understand, very very little was it like it was in uh, 19th century America where they would go and actually kidnap people from another country uh, and, and bring them to another country to be sold as slaves. Often it was war, the spoils of war. If they went into a country and conquered it, they could take people as slaves or, 
or if you were born into slavery or things like that. But, but every once in a while, you would then have a, a, a market where you take these slaves into this place and then buyers could come and they could look at the people and say, okay, I want that person for my, for my house or for my farm or whatever, and they would buy these, uh, these slaves. Now, the Bible's not making commentary that that was right or wrong. Obviously, it was wrong, but it was also a part of life. And often, slaves were well-treated. But this is, the, this is the word that comes from that idea of a slave market. And to be bought out of the slave market, the word that's, that's translated in our Bible is the word redeemed. He gave us freedom from that slavery so that we could enjoy a different kind of servanthood with God. He bought us with a price. What price? Notice it says, in whom we have redemption through his blood. He paid the price for us. Now, I don't know about you, but most days, all days, <laughs> I feel like he overpaid for me. I feel like I wasn't worth what he paid. And I try to live my life like, like, like in some way I could make it so it was worth it. And if I imagine myself standing on the slave block and, and watching people come by and, and watching Satan come up to me and, and he wants to pay the price for me. And let's say it's $5,000 and he offers $10,000. And I would do anything to get away from this guy, but, but I, I, I know that he's going to make me his slave. And, and let's say Christ comes by and he looks at me and he says, I'll give everything for him so that he doesn't have to go be a master to Satan. That's what Christ did for me. He didn't just give a matching amount. He gave everything. He gave his blood. Amen. He gave his relationship with his father. He gave the dignity, his dignity. He gave his life for me. The word forgiveness here in this passage, the word means, uh, and this is a great thing, I didn't realize this, I don't know if it's always like this, I didn't have time to do the whole study, but the word forgiveness in the Greek literally means to send away. That in forgiveness, Christ has taken my sins and sent them away. That he moves them away from me forever. Like it says in the Old Testament, as far as the East is from the West. Um, that's what forgiveness is. He no longer considers our sin. He has sent them away. Is He no longer considers my sin as a part of my account because they are now gone. And he then, what the Bible says is that he gives me his righteousness and takes away my sin. Now again, how did he do this? It says, through his blood. Through his blood. His blood was the price paid for our salvation out of the slave market. It was the ransom for my sin. 1 Peter 1, verses 18 and 19 says, For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things, such as silver and gold from your vain conversation, received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. That's a picture of the Old Testament sacrifice. In the Old Testament, you would take a perfect lamb and you would take it into the to the um, priest and he would hold a cup uh, under the throat and you would take that and you would slip the blood of that lamb and then the priest would catch that blood and he'd take it and he'd throw it at the base of the altar and that was a covering for your sin. And year after year after year, we'll get into this in Hebrews later on in the book, but year after year after year, they would have to take that blood and throw it at the altar and say, God, for one more year, cover my sin. For the things I did this last year, Lord, cover my sin. And it was when Christ came that his blood paid for my sins once for all. I've been living with the Lord now for 37 years. Amen. His blood has so far covered 42 years of sin. I didn't sin probably very much in my first five years, but Christ's blood has paid for all those sins. He paid for mine and for yours. He, he redeemed me out of the slave market of all those years of servitude to Satan. I'm so thankful. I, don't, I honestly, I don't know what my life would have been like without Christ. I, 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 don't have a, I don't even have a guess if I hadn't been saved at the age of five years old what my life would have been like. I know my heart and I know what uh, I, I know what things 
I think and sometimes what my desires are and uh, I, I know the way that I want in some ways my life to be and with without Christ reining me in and changing me and moving me I, I don't know what kind of person I would be but I, I can't think it would be good I don't know that I'd be in this church building without you with you tonight if I hadn't been for Christ saving me at five I, I'm not a better person than any person I'm not I'm not I'm not inherently good I just know that Christ rescued me he delivered me when I was five years old and uh, and from then on uh, all those years in the slave market I, I hate to think about what that would, was like being a slave to Satan for all those years I'm so glad he saved me when he did that I don't have all the regrets of those things I'm glad I don't even have an idea of what my life would have looked like um, God has been so so good to me and if you're here tonight and you did have a life that uh, that before you know you got saved and you remember you know the trajectory God has been so good to you as well right. you maybe in some ways have a better idea of what that slave market looked like and and Christ took his blood and redeemed you out of it now again not just because he felt sorry for you because there was nothing in you that made him want to do that he just loved you now this is a good thing to think about because if God loved me when I was an enemy and if God loved me when he had no reason to love me then then God loves me now no matter what I do no matter what I can do God is always loving it doesn't mean we can do whatever we want it just means that the moment you're ready to come back that he's there for you that he has already paid the blood of his son for you to be redeemed and forgiven his blood was what satiated or propitiated the wrath of God Romans 3 verses 24 and 25 says being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus whom God has set forth to be a propitiation that word means the satisfaction of the wrath God was angry and there's only one thing that could satiate his, that could save his wrath and that was this through his through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God the, he paid the ultimate price for our freedom and our forgiveness even though we are undeserving of it when you got saved you got more than just freedom from hell that was a wonderful thing and that would have been enough but what God has done is he has given you an inheritance he has delivered you from the power of darkness and he has translated you into the kingdom of his dear son he has given you redemption and he has given you forgiveness now the more you know about this the more you read the fine print of what happened to you when you got saved the more I think you'll have gratitude for what God's done the more you'll say every day thank you God and honestly some of the things that you're facing will seem pretty small in comparison you think about what life would be like if you didn't have an inheritance of heaven if you still lived in the power under the power of darkness if you had no uh if you never been translated into god's kingdom you had no even idea of what god's people were like and if you didn't have forgiveness and didn't have redemption think about how different your life would be think about how um, despondent you would be and i think just thinking about that would make us more grateful people Second, I think that when you understand that, you'll understand your position in him for freedom. Meaning this, that, that you'll understand uh, my position in Christ means that I now have the freedom to live for God. And I now have the ability to do what I could not do before, not in my own power, but in his. And, uh, and, and now I can, again, get into this and in Colossians is going to talk a lot more about these things but just thinking about what it means to be a Christian and all the great benefits that we have really helps us to understand our freedom in him and then third is just I think gives us a desire to live for him I mean if I knew that somebody if I, again if I if I knew that somebody some millionaire um, made me an heir of his vast fortune and I no, nothing I've done for my, nothing I've done for at all. If I know that He delivered me from a kingdom of darkness, 
into a, a nice living. If I'd known that he had wiped out my debts and forgiven all those things, and then called me on the phone and said, hey, do you think that you could, whatever, whatever it was, uh, I couldn't say no, right? As a millionaire benefactor calls me up and says, would you mind getting some, some pizza and bringing it over? What am I gonna say? I'm too busy. Uh, I don't really wanna do that. I don't, I don't wanna spend the gas money on that, right? <laughs> Think about how foolish that would be if God has done so much for us. But what is left for us to do? Now again, doing those things aren't going to get you any closer to God, but just in God and making us a new creature. What does he say in Ephesians 2.10? We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God foreordained that we should walk in them. God wants us to live for him. And the more we understand who we are in Christ and what he's done for us, I think the easier that gets. Uh, the hard part that when we don't walk in obedience is when we think that we're bigger stuff than we really are. And we forget what God has done for us. So let's let's remember these things. Let's let's have fun reading the fine print.